Michael, please do turn with me to John's Gospel and chapter 14. Now it's Harvest Sunday, I suppose, but rather than particularly uh, referring to harvest this morning, what I want to do is to think about what harvest reminds us of, and that is life. Now, in John 14 and verse 6, we are told that the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the way and the truth and the life. In previous weeks, we thought about the Lord Jesus Christ as the way to the Father and to the Father's house. And we've thought about the Lord Jesus Christ as truth, in that he's the one that reveals God. There's more to say about Christ as truth. Maybe we'll come back to that on another occasion. But this morning, what I want us to think about is what the Lord Jesus Christ means when he says, I am the life. See, life's important, isn't it? Now, it's an obvious thing to say, but it, it really is. All life comes from God. All life is sustained by God. All life is to be received with thankfulness. It's good that harvest reminds us of that. But is this physical life all that there is to life itself? Or is the reality of life, the life that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about here, something more than just the physical and the biological? Well, absolutely. To understand life in its fullness, the life that the Lord Jesus Christ has come to give, we need to think about life as God intends it. We'll do a little bit of background, the origin of life. Now the prevailing view that's taught at the moment, as I'm sure you know, um, is a, a naturalistic one. And what I mean by that is, it's the view that everything has come into being by means of natural mechanical forces. Um, and that means the physical inanimate things like rocks and gas and stars. It also means the biological and living things like single cell organisms and blue whales. And it also means moral and intellectual things like Mozart and Hitler. The view is that all of those things have come about naturally as a result of the random crash of atoms and the way that such processes develop. It's a naturalistic view. The key issue isn't what we think about creation and evolution. The key issue is that structurally, that view has no place for God. But that's a view which scientific people can neither prove nor disprove whether or not there's a God. It doesn't seem fair to assume that there is no God and build a whole structure which excludes it. You know, there are problems with some of the theories anyway. Everybody who's involved in these things will accept this. Even at the most basic level, where did the original matter or energy come from? Has it always been there or did it have an origin? These are the things that scientists and thinkers are struggling with and have done for generations and will do for generations. Nobody's got it sealed in a box with a ribbon tied around it. These are big issues. But what it seems, you see, to me is that what we need to think about is that God speaks to us in this world. In the physical world, which we can explore by means of science, absolutely. But he also speaks to us in other ways. He speaks to us in his word, the Bible, and ultimately he speaks to us in his son, Jesus Christ. And if we properly understand those two things, we have to understand that because God is the God of truth, they all speak with one voice. One isn't going to contradict the other if properly understood. And so that helps to give us some kind of framework and some kind of shape when we think about the issues of the origin of life. Now let me just say this. The Bible clearly teaches that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And also he tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word, the eternal Son of God, was involved in that process. He was the agent of creation. So in John's Gospel, the very first verse, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Ultimately, all life, physical, biological, 
spiritual, moral, intellectual. It all ultimately comes into being through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's important. We're also told in Scripture that it's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who's the one who sustains life. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us he upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, we're not told how, but what we're told is the world isn't chaos. The world isn't the old deistic thing that it's like a clock that God wound up at the beginning and then he just steps back and lets it run. It's not like that. God is involved in the universe. God is everywhere present. And the very existence of the world, the continuation of the world, ultimately finds its reality in God. But that's true of you and it's true of me as well. It's not just true of the cosmos on this massive scale. You see, see what you think of this. I think it's quite hard to accept that the difference between Mozart and a cucumber is just a matter of the number of chromosomes. I know it sounds stupid, but think about it. If life is purely biological and physical, how do we explain some of the things that seem to be so unique and so remarkable about human life? Um, if you show a four-year-old a family photo album, or oh, there's you learning to ride your bike when you were two. Here's you when you were one. Your, your Auntie Ethel's holding you. And then you go back a bit and say, oh, here's Uncle so-and-so. And here's your granddad. And there's your granddad and your grandmother on the day they got married. And the four-year-old will say, where am I? Where am I in the pictures? Oh, that picture was taken before you existed. Don't understand that. And then we ourselves, we come towards the end of life, or we have someone near to us that we love that dies, as inevitably happens, and there's something in us which says, but it's not the end, is it? It's not the end. All that life, all that vitality, that intellect, that emotion, that relationship, all that moral content, that person, Surely it's not just a matter of the physical winding down and then nothing. It seems to us very natural, doesn't it, very real, that there's something about human life which just transcends the biological. It's so much more. Now, the explanation for that is that all life comes from God, but it's more than that. It's that there's a dimension to human life which is spiritual which is beyond the biological. In the creation account in the book of Genesis, God said, let the earth bring forth a living creature according to its kind. On the third day, he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. You notice, let the earth bring forth the creatures, but I am going to bring forth man. I'm going to mold him and I'm going to shape him. And I'm going to breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. There's something particular about the way man was made, which is over and above the way that all the other biological creatures were made. And because of that, men and women are made in the image of God. Now, Calvin, the old reformer, has been debates about this for centuries, but Calvin, the old reformer, said, the image of God is really everything which differentiates man from all the other animals. Because that's what makes him man. The fact that over and above the other animals, there's something about him that resembles God. You can argue about that if you like, I don't mind. But Calvin takes this big view, you see. And so what that means is things like people can write poetry and people can dance. Squids don't do that. You know, they just don't. People are aware of God and they worship. Monkeys don't worship. And we recognise that when a human being is murdered, or when a child is mistreated, or a vulnerable adult is taken advantage of, that is so much more serious than the killing or mistreatment of an animal, however noble that great ape might be. Why is that? 
is because we recognise there's something about human life which is holy. There's something about human life that's over and above the physical. There's something about people that resembles God. I don't know if you've ever seen a scan of a baby in the womb. Lovely thing. You think, oh, I can see the head and I can see the spine. I don't know what the rest of that stuff is. But then you look at it and you think, wow, in three months, four months' time, that's going to be a baby that I can hold in my arms. And you think of Psalm 139. I'll praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. See, life, human life, it's a gift from God, and Christ is the author of life. Okay. John chapter 14, the Lord Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so what he's saying is, his coming into the world is to give men and women life. He's the way to the Father. He's the truth to reveal God to them. He's the life. But if he has to give us life, it means life is something that we lack. So he's not talking about biological life. We've all got that. He's talking about the real spiritual dimension of life. The thing that makes us human beings in relationship with God. He's talking about the aspect of life that's gone wrong. That's what he's come to restore and he's come to deal with. So let's think about that. The origin of life, okay. But the counterfeit life, this is what the Lord Jesus has come to challenge and to deal with. Now, life as God gave it has been overcome by tragedy. That's obvious to everybody. Mankind has fallen from a situation where God could pronounce it very good into a situation that we see in the history books and we see all around us. And let me just give you three or four things, okay? The first one is, in place of good, there's now evil in human life. And the presence of evil in the world is absolutely undeniable. Everybody knows it and everybody's concerned about it, but nobody really seems to be able to do anything. One of the great thinkers of the last century, he was quite convinced for a period in his life that um, evil, it, it was just a negative, it was just the absence of good. It's a philosophical thing, it was just the absence of good. Until he started to have personal experience of people who had been involved in war. And then he came to the settled conclusion, this is more than just the absence of good. This is an active force. This is something which is destructive in human life. What do we see about this? Well, evil affects governments, doesn't it? It affects corporations. It affects young people and gangs. It affects shoplifters. There's a big increase in shoplifting in the UK, isn't it? And that's a bit of a social tragedy because some people are shoplifting because they're really struggling to make ends meet. And some people are shoplifting because the, charges, the shops charge too much in the first place. So it's only fair they take a bit back. And other people are shoplifting so that they can sell it. Strange. It's, it's going on. But you also get the reality of this sort of thing with unfaithful spouses and all the kind of relational pain that we see around us. But what we find is, when we get to know people who are involved in things like that, or when we stop and look into the mirror, and get to know ourselves. That the reality of evil in our lives isn't just something on the outside. It's not just the effect of society around us. The reality of evil is something that characterizes us and it comes from the inside. In the Old Testament, in the book of Ecclesiastes, we read this. Truly this only I have found that God made man upright, but they've sought out many schemes. It says devices in the old translation. God made man upright, but man's had a better idea. He sought out loads of other stuff that wasn't what God planned for him to do. But the result of that has been quite destructive and dramatic. You know, you see God's standards clearly in Scripture, in the Ten Commandments, 
in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. But men and women live differently, and they do it by choice. How many of you have ever robbed a bank? If you have, you don't have to put your hand up, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> How many of you would say, I would never consider robbing a bank? Yeah? But think of the things that you have considered, and then you have done. That comes from the inside, doesn't it? It comes from the heart. And we all know the truth that when we hold things in our hearts and when we dwell on them and when we start to do them, that that starts us on a path which grows and grows. There's an old saying, sow a thought and reap an act, sow an act and reap a habit, sow a habit and reap a character, sow a character and reap a destiny. You see, the reality of evil rather than good. It's a counterfeit life. It's not life as God intended. Second thing, in place of God, there's self. Now that's the original lie of the devil. The devil said, don't listen to God, do what you want, find your own way, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Get it in Genesis. And that's what we hear all around us today. Find your own way in life, work out what works best for you, just do it, you decide what's good and evil, don't let anybody else tell you, you crack on, you are the captain of your own ship, you are in charge of your own destiny, you decide. And the reality is, once you take the cork out of that particular bottle, you can never put it back in. People often experience that the hard way. And once we make those decisions, and we experience that evil, those mistakes. It taints us and it changes us. Now think about this. We live for ourselves as men and women, but that's just foolishness in the extreme. After all, we can't deliver ourselves in time of trouble, do we? We can't turn the clock back and do things properly. We find ourselves in life all at sea. But often we don't have the humility to just acknowledge that we've been wrong and that we need the help of God in our lives. Uh, people delight in all sorts of things. I remember in a meeting once, evangelistic meeting, I said something like, I was the most precious thing in your life. And somebody said, it's my telly. Well, that's honest, isn't it? It's my telly. But people delight in all sorts of things. The weekend, Saturdays, holidays, relationships, sport, some things that are really good, some things that are not so good. But you know what people don't delight in? They don't delight in God. The only one who's truly good, the only one who really cares, and the only one who can really help. So Paul says in Romans 3, there's none who understands, there's none who seeks after God. Now let me suggest to you that that is not what life is supposed to be like. That's a counterfeit life. And something has gone on. Third thing, in place of peace, there's turmoil and uncertainty. There's a trend at the moment that everybody seems to be aware of and concerned about, which is the increase in anxiety in society in general, and also particularly among young people. But there's a problem of uncertainty and turmoil that goes far deeper than that. Because you know, life is uncertain. Life is uncertain, and you don't know what's just around the corner. Will my partner always love me? It's an issue. What will happen if I lose my job? What will happen if I lose my health? How will I cope if I end up in a care home? See, a life without God is a life left alone with the forces that we can neither understand nor control. It's a life where we have to face the wolves without the aid of the good shepherd. And it's a tragedy. But there's more than that. Because a life lived without God ultimately doesn't satisfy. Because despite all its promises and all our hopes and all our effort, ultimately we find ourselves dry and empty. I saw something on the telly just recently. Um, somebody was talking about um, 
his life and the opportunities he had in his life and the big things that he'd been able to do in his life and the success he had. And he said, but the one thing I learned early was all of that success could not make me happy. I wasn't just a program, I was just a guy who was saying from his own experience. I learned it didn't make me happy. With those other advantages came other pressures and other responsibilities. And my sense of uncertainty about who I was actually deepened and got worse because more was expected of me and I felt even more inadequate. Isn't that tragic? My people have committed two evils, says the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You see the two evils. Forsake God, make your own God. Forsake satisfaction, seek your own satisfaction. Forsake security, build your own security. And you know what happens? They hold no water. Ultimately, they leave dry and empty. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, that men and women have no hope and are without God in the world. Fourth thing, and then we'll be more positive. In place of heaven, there's hell. Now life was designed to last forever, just as God is the ever-living God. But when men and women reject God, it comes at a cost. Remember Genesis 2? Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There's the problem of mankind. Why do men and women die? It's because they reject God in terms of the cost. But in personal lives, it maps out like that. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death, Proverbs 14. We've got to be honest about that, you see. Because life is more than the biological. Life is spiritual. We are made to be people who know God. We are made to resemble him. We are made to be moral and to make decisions. We are made to choose. When we reject God in our choices, it inevitably has consequences. God is right in all his ways. And what that means is he always deals with us fairly and rightly. If we live without him, we die without him, and we spend eternity without him. And if we're without God, what do we have? We have the things that we've put into our lives in place of him, revealed to us in their true colours. We have our shame, and we have our guilt, and we have the constant reminder of God's holiness and of his displeasure. Life wasn't designed to be like that. And so we read, the Lord Jesus Christ is life. So let's be positive now. The Lord Jesus Christ is the life. There's two things here. The first one is he displays life as it should be. That's what you see in Christ. But also he gives life. He gives the life that we so desperately so, the Lord Jesus Christ displays life as it should be. What does that mean? It means that he's full of life in himself. He lived life as it should be lived. Now, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't easy. No surprise, life in this world isn't easy. Yeah, we'd be fools if we think that life should always be easy. It's inevitably not going to be easy when we're surrounded by such sorrow and such pain. But the life of the Lord Jesus Christ was faithful and good and useful. He displayed remarkable peace and certainty in the midst of turmoil and trouble. Think about it. When he's hard pressed by the needs of others, he's not overwhelmed. When he's bombarded by temptation, he's not overcome. When he's surrounded by forces too powerful for any mere man to deal with, like a storm on the sea, He's not shaken, but he sleeps quietly, safe in the hand of his Father. It's a life that's lived in fellowship with God, 
a life as it should be. He knew the Father. Now, there's no true life which is cut off from the source of life. Um, I don't know if you ever plugged your phone into a mobile phone charger and then you've gone off and made a cup of tea and you've gone off to do something else, you come back and your phone's dead. And you think, what's going on? I'm sure I plugged it in. Yeah, well, you plugged it in this end, but you didn't plug it in that end, did you? It's cut off from the source of life. So there can be no life, no real life. The Lord Jesus Christ lived life as it should be lived because he knew the Father. We can live our lives like people who never look up. We think that the ceiling is the some extent of life. It's all just horizontal. But go outside and look up. Look up to the trees and the mountains and the clouds and the stars and realize there's so much more. It's important, isn't it, that we get that grip. Christ knew the Father. He delighted in the Father. <coughs> and his living relationship with the Father shaped and coloured the whole of his life. Life as a be. Christ delighted in the Father. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart and soul and mind and strength. He prayed to him. He learned his words. He delighted in his presence. He spent time with the Father. He did his will. Now, doing the will of the Father, this is often misunderstood, you see. I don't know if um, you have a classroom full of naughty boys. Can you say naughty boys these days? You know what I mean. You have a classroom full of naughty boys. While the teacher's there, they know what they're supposed to do. When a teacher goes out, uh, paper planes, chewing gum, jump out the window, fights, it all happens, isn't it? When a teacher comes back, they know what they're supposed to do. Are they doing the teacher's will? Well, sort of. But you know, really doing the Father's will is because he loves the Father and delights in him. That's the motivation. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart and soul and mind and strength. And the effect of that true love was to do the Father's will. John 6, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. You see that? And it was in him, and it wasn't a burden to him. I delight to do your will, oh my God. Now isn't that life as life should be lived? Don't we like to think that in our relationships, that's what they are like. That we do what our partner would want us to do, whether they're watching us or not. Have you cut that grass yet? But it's much more significant than that, isn't it? We do what our partner wants us to do because we love them. This is Christ's relationship with the Father. And it colours the way he lives in public and in private, in all aspects. He delights to do his will. And the outworking of that, he served other people. Acts 10. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He healed the sick, he delivered them from the power of evil spirits, he fed the hungry, he raised the dead. You see, his life was a selfless life. And at the end of the day, it's a selfless life that we really admire, isn't it? The people who really give themselves for the sake of others are the ones whose names stand in history, that people look back on and they find them an inspiration because they were people who recognised the value of serving others other than themselves. But Christ, it was very sharp and very pointed. The Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life answer for me. Why? Love. Because greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Right. That's the first part, right? I'm saying a lot to you, so I need to pause a little. That's the first big point about the Lord Jesus Christ here. He's full of life. Now all that, <coughs> let me just ask you, wouldn't you like to have a life like the life of the Lord Jesus Christ? You can't be God, don't be wrong, but a life where you know God, a life where 
Your life has purpose. A life where you're able to serve others. A life where you're able to go to bed at night with a clear conscience. A life where you have a hope that when you die, you go to be with the Father. A life that's valuable and fulfilling and satisfying. Because you know the Father's love and you know the Father's love. Doesn't that sound like a good life? What's the most important thing in your life? It's my tell me. Can you tell me, do not you? What's the most important thing in my life? It's my kids. I heard somebody say to me once, I don't know. But can your kids do that for you? In fact, isn't the truth that you can serve and love your kids better if you're able to do it with a heart which is right with God? Do you see the point? Life is it supposed to be. Right, here's the second thing. He's full of life, but he's full of life for us. Christ has come to give us life. So let me give you, I've got to watch the time, so let me give you a couple of things here. Right? He gives us a right to life. That's the first thing he does. He gives us a right to life. This is what I mean. If you have somebody who is uh, condemned for a capital crime, they have no right to life. There's just been a guy in Japan who's just been released from death row after, I think, 58 years. They found out he didn't do it. If somebody's committed to death row, they have no right to life. In America, when they leave the cell and they go to the execution room, uh, they say, dead man walking. They have no right to life. They condemn, they forfeited their right to life. Before the law of God, that's our position, the soul that sins shall die. But Christ changes that. He gives us a right to live. He gives us a right to life. You see, when the law says, the soul that sins shall die, Christ steps forward and he gives his life in our place. He dies. He dies so that those that are condemned might live. He dies the death his people deserve. He endures the hell that his people deserve. And out of his tomb flows never-ending life. It's difficult to talk about hell. I've mentioned it twice already today. But it's important that we recognize it is a scriptural truth. The three hours of darkness that Christ experienced on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, are the outer darkness into which men and women are cast. That's the picture. They cast away from God into outer darkness. Here's the darkness, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see parallel. But that eternity is compressed into three hours and given to Christ. Because Christ is great enough. Christ can bear it. He can pay the price in full. He himself is the sacrifice for our sins. He's the one, the God-man. And when Christ suffers in our place, it has infinite value because he has given himself for his people. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness lay. Then bursting forth, you notice that, in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Bursting forth. When the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he burst forth. It wasn't possible for death to hold him. And out of the tomb, out of the death, out of the veins, if I can put it like that, of the Lord Jesus Christ, <coughs> bursts forth a flood of forgiveness for men and women like us. You see, if a condemned prisoner receives a pardon, that moment when he receives the pardon, he no longer has to die, he has a right to live. And if anyone, if the judge were to take his life, he would be committing a crime. It cannot be done. He has a right to live. And so it is with everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. 
Now listen to something. Life is in you. And when we have that sort of life, the right to live, it means we can have peace with God. Peace with God. God isn't angry with our sins. They've been taken away by Christ. We can come to the Father and know that he is at peace with us and we can be at peace with him. And whatever our consciences might say, Christ has answered. Christ has answered. And so whenever we're accused, we take it to Christ and we say, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've taken these things away and that you've set me free and that I don't have to bear the implications of them. I know in time and in eternity I'm safe because you've delivered me from them. It's life from the dead. Very quickly, we need to do the other one. He doesn't just give us a right to life, but he gives us life on the inside. Think of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loved the Father. He served others. He had fellowship with God. He loved what was right and pure. He resisted temptation. He lived in the way that God would have him live. There's life on the inside there, isn't there? Proper life. And the Lord Jesus Christ gives life on the inside to his people as well. Now, here's a picture. You haven't got any flowers? We've got flowers. I don't know if you've ever done this. If you get a flower which has got light colored petals, white, yellow, something like that, and you uh, put it in a vase of water, but put some ink in the water, dark ink, black, blue, something like that. If you wait a little while, what will happen is the flower will suck up that water. It'll go up into the petals, and the veins in the petals will change colour. What gets into the plant shows itself in the plant's life. Can you see that? By nature, what's in our hearts shows itself in our lives. Out of the heart come evil thoughts and enemies. We talk about Matthew's gospel. Well, when the Lord Jesus Christ changes the heart, it flows out into the life. So Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Where do they come from in your life? They come from a heart that's been changed by the Spirit of God. When the Lord Jesus Christ saves us, he doesn't just forgive us, but in our hearts, he sets us free. That's vital, isn't it? That's life. A life to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust him. A life to turn away from sin. A life to follow Jesus Christ. A life to be transformed. He goes on in John chapter 10 to say, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Now I know lots of Christians, if you look around and you think, abundant life. If you talk to them, they say they're only just holding on and they think it is. Abundant life. Hold on now. That they might have life and have it abundantly. How much forgiveness have you got if you're a Christian? Abundant, isn't it? It's abundant. We need to recognize that. We need to thank God for it. We need to rejoice in it. It's abundant. How much acceptance have you got if you're a Christian? Does the Father just about tolerate you? Or does he run to you, throw his arms around you and embrace you, put a cloak on you and kiss you? Does he take you home and does he feed you and does he care for you? And does he rejoice and tell other people, this son of mine who was dead is alive? It's abundant acceptance, isn't it? How much joy do you have? Well, that's more difficult. But if those things are true of us, shouldn't our joy be growing? And be perhaps more abundant than it is? How much comfort do you have? That's difficult. But if you have a father on the throne, if you have a saviour who cares for you, if you have one who promises that he'll walk with you and never leave you nor forsake you, if you have one you can turn to in time of trouble and know that he understands what you're going through, even if you can't form the words to tell him, and if he's one who promises that he will pour in oil and wine that restores your soul, can't we find comfort in that? Peace I leave with you. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
Do you see what the Saviour is saying? It's a heresy for people to say a Christian life is less satisfying than the life I had before I was a Christian. It's a heresy because it denies the very nature of life and it denies the greatness of what Christ has done for us. If that's true, then the life of heaven will be even worse. Do you see the point? Because then we experience life in all its fullness. We need to hold on to that. And we need to recognise that all these things come to us through Jesus Christ. Now our time is gone, so I'm of course going to say one more thing. It also means life in the Father's house. The Lord Jesus says this, I go to prepare a place for you, verse 3. If I go, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You see, because I live, said the Lord Jesus, you will live also, John 14. It means life in the Father's house. When Christ saves us, he forgives us. When Christ saves us, he changes us, and that change grows. Thank God for it. When Christ saves us, he guarantees us a home in heaven. Because he's done the work on the cross to open the new and living way. He's given us everlasting life, the life of the age to come, a life that never ends. But he's done that for us. We've got another reason to rejoice. Isn't our life abundant if we know that it won't be long until we see the Saviour as he is and we like him and we can rejoice in his presence forever? Let's pray. Father, on this Lord's Day morning, we thank you. We thank you that your word is true. You know us and we know what we need. Father, press into our hearts what we need to take from us this morning. In goodness and mercy, let us never think that the Lord Jesus Christ is anything less than he is. The way and the truth and the life. And Father, might we, each one of us, find by your mercy and grace that we can trust Christ, that he might be our way and our truth and our life, both today and forever. We pray it in his great name.